we will start in uh, two minutes in order to let the last uh, panelist to join us. Sir, Almira, sir, ladies yeah, okay. and gentlemen, we shall start now the webinar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for being online today. I am Captain Bertrand the French liaison officer at IFC Iowa. I, along with the operations officer, will be conducting the workshop. On behalf of Captain Mo Honti, director of IFC Iowa, and Mr. Martin Kochingot, Crimayo project director, I extend a warm welcome to you all from India, more precisely, in Gurugram, just south of New Delhi, where the IFC IOR is located. We are extremely pleased to see such a high turnout for this important workshop on maritime domain awareness and interoperability. For your information, the workshop is also being live streamed on YouTube. May I request all speakers to kindly switch on your camera for a quick snapshot. Excellent. Thank you. We would now be enabling camera for the speakers on. As we commence the opening session, I once again highlight that the administrative instructions and speakers biodata have been posted in the chat box. I now invite Mr. Sepul Nomi Deputy Head EU Delegation to India and Bhutan for opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, can you hear me? Good. Uh, dear uh, Vice Admiral Rabit Singh, Admiral Professor Yanat Kolombaj, organizers, distinguished participants, friends. The EU has recognized the importance of a safe and more secure Indian Ocean as the prerequisite to a thriving blue economy when, over a decade ago, it started long-term initiatives to support maritime governance through EU NAVFOR Atlanta, EU CAP Somalia, and the Critical Maritime Routes Project. All three initiatives are still active until this very day. Building on this success, the EU then developed its maritime security strategy in 2014, demonstrating the priority that the organization was attributing to maritime security 
which was followed by the EU's global strategy in 2016. Then last September, the EU adopted its Indo-Pacific strategy for cooperation, an umbrella framework to coordinate its collaborative ventures in the region, facilitating the mobilization of a variety of tools. At the same time, India-EU cooperative engagements dovetail well into the three strategies mentioned earlier with the annual high-level maritime security dialogue, providing guidance for enhanced cooperation, which is steadily increasing. Such engagements replicated in priority countries across the Indo-Pacific offer India, the EU and, and the regional partners an opportunity to exchange thoughts on the evolving strategic landscape, whilst also highlighting areas where our joint resolve could lead to tangible cooperative ventures. This first interoperability workshop co-organized by the Indian Navy's Information Fusion Center for the Indian Ocean region and the European Union's Crimario project is another uh, fine example of the flourishing cooperation between India and the EU in the field of maritime security, building on the third India-EU maritime security workshop, which was just held last week. And the EU, EUN for Atlanta India Navy exercise earlier this year. Today's discussion, however, is more technical in nature as it delves into the subject of mar maritime domain awareness, more specifically interoperability. Knowing what is happening at sea gives states time to analyze and prepare themselves to address incidents at sea or emanating from the sea rather than reacting when it is too late. This is particularly pertinent in the in Indian Ocean region where coastal states often face common threats and challenges. The workshop will tap into the rich experience of various organizations active in the Indian Ocean who have agreed to join forces with the Indian Navy and Crimaria to share knowledge about their respective practices as well as their experiences. Before concluding, I would like to shift focus to Crimaria, an EU development instrument designed to enhance information sharing and improve operational capability in the region. Its raison d'etre is to offer a medium through which regional actors can interface with one another through a variety of means, including IORIS, the Indo-Pacific Regional Information Sharing Platform. IORIS is an established information exchange system, which also happens to be backbone for regional maritime safety and security exercises that Crimario organizes, complementing its law enforcement training opportunities. Crimario is now working towards interconnecting information fusion centers through its Share.IT initiative, an interoperability framework which has recently started. To conclude this workshop, offers us an opportunity to have frank and open discussions, leading to a better understanding of how we each view regional security challenges, even if we may see them through different lenses. I would like to thank IFCR, IOR and Crimario for organizing this significant initiative, as well as the invited speakers who have accepted to impart valuable knowledge to all participants. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you an excellent workshop. Thank you very much, sir.
May I now invite Vice Admiral Rav Singh, Deputy Chief of Naval Staff, Indian Navy, for his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you. China. Mr. Sepo Nurmi, the Deputy Head of the European Union Delegation to India and Bhutan, distinguished speakers, members from various information fusion and maritime security centers, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the India-EU workshop on maritime domain awareness and interoperability, jointly organized by the Information Fusion Center Indian Ocean Region, IFC Iowa, and the Critical Maritime Routes Indian Ocean Region 2 Primaria 2 program. At the outset, I must compliment the organizers for putting together this workshop on maritime security and safety of the global commons. The gathering today is a microcosm of the maritime community with participants ranging from Japan, Australia, representing the Far East, EU countries from the North, United States, the Far West, and Madagascar and Seychelles, the Deep South. This is the representation of the term global commons in the truest sense. With more than 75% of the world's maritime trade and 66% of daily global oil consumption passing through the IOR, this region is vital to world trade and the economic prosperity of many nations. However, we are also aware that the IOR has its security challenges with such threats such as terrorism, piracy, human and contraband trafficking, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, armed running and poaching being some of those. Facilitations of an environment that encourages the lawful use of the seas is an endeavor that we are constantly striving for. Additionally, this region also experiences a large number of natural and man-made disasters requiring quick response and provision of aid. You all would appreciate that response to these challenges require a high level of maritime domain awareness in order to enable timely response by maritime security agencies. The scale, scope, and multinational nature of maritime activities make it, makes it untenable for individual countries to address these challenges. Hence, collaborative efforts between maritime nations and the level of interoperability are essential to enhance security at sea. I am also sanguine about the collaborative efforts for maritime domain awareness that are underway under the aegis of the European Union's Crimario program. The support rendered by EU in setting up the Regional Maritime Information Fusion Center at Madagascar, the Regional Coordination and Overseas Centers at Seychelles, and the assistance in providing technical solutions for information sharing between countries in the Southwest Iowa are highly appreciable. This workshop is also indicated of the common understanding reached between India and the European Union under the aegis of the joint India-EU Maritime Security Dialogue held in January this year. Ladies and gentlemen, I make use of these terms collaborative and interoperable in a very deliberate manner. Not only do we need to address our common challenges together, we need to also be on the same page insofar as our understanding of concepts response mechanisms, standard operating procedures, and modes of communication are concerned. I'm sure this workshop would be a step in this direction. Securing the seas for the prosperity and well-being of all nations in the region has been an enduring vision of India and that of the Indian Navy. We firmly believe that the only way to optimally harness individual strengths is to follow a collaborative approach. Focusing on collective capability, building and combating maritime threats and challenges together. This also a consonance is in consonance with the vision of Sagar of our Honorable Prime Minister, which stands for security and growth for all in the region. The need for cooperation amongst like-minded stakeholders for safeguarding our maritime routes are further highlighted by our Honorable Prime Minister in the United Nations high-level open debate on maritime security in August this year. As we all know that in the maritime domain, there are no boundaries and our threats and challenges therefore are common. I am certain that this workshop will witness to an intriguing exchange of thoughts and ideas 
with the lineup of illustrious speakers from global and regional organizations, think tanks, and shipping community would show, surely go a long way in enhancing the common understanding of contemporary maritime challenges and delve into the existing regional MDA framework to identify gaps and forge a common way ahead towards tracking these. It only remains me for me to wish all the participants best of luck for the workshop. May you all have an enriching experience, both on the professional as also the personal front, and we establish enduring work. Wish you all a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Jai Hind. Thank you very much, Anur. Now, I introduce a mirror professor, Jayanath Kolombej, erstwhile commander of Sri Lankan Navy, and the current foreign secretary to the government of Sri Lanka. The annual is also an independent scholar on Indian Ocean Rim Association, and will speak for about 10 minutes on the IORA perspective to addressing maritime security threats, including information actions. Over to you, sir. Mute. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Primario, for inviting me to be with you and to uh, share my thoughts on a very important uh, topic, the Indian Ocean Rim Association perspective to addressing maritime security threats. If I heard right, I will speak for 10 minutes. So I was earlier told 15 minutes, but what's the time I should speak to? Yes, sir. 10 minutes, please. Okay. Right. So then let me quickly go through my presentation. I mean, I am talking to you from a, a, a Iora literal uh, perspective in the Indian Ocean and also the lead country in maritime safety and maritime security. We all know that the Indian Ocean, as we all know, is the is becoming the key ocean in the world. And the tradition, the maritime security threats are changing somewhat. You, you know, new threats are being added, and the existing threats are taking a slightly a different term, a different uh, a, a way every now and then. And in that, we really need to understand the Indian Ocean and the maritime security threats. And then we have to find our way. How do we overcome uh, these issues which are confronting us on a day-to-day -day basis? Now, if I very uh, quickly summarize the, as I think, the next five years, what are the maritime security threats? I think the traditional military conflict, the naval conflict that is looming around us, whether it will become a, a real or not, that is a great thing if it doesn't become real, but it is looming around us. Then economic crisis. Now the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has given another security dimension to the Indian Ocean. That is the economic downturn of many of the countries. And terrorism and violence, violent extremism. Countries who have not experienced violent extremism or terrorism will not, not put this on top of the maritime security threats. But Sri Lanka, having gone through both in a very bad way, we think that the Indian Ocean is very vulnerable for maritime terrorism and also religious extremism. Then, of course, natural and man-made disasters. We know that the, uh, the MV Express Pearl incident, which happened in, uh, in the waters of Sri Lanka. Now, this is Indian Ocean, and it could have been prevented at, in many places, but it did not happen. It came to Sri Lanka, and the major disaster was created. And of course, there can be some maritime disorder, and that could lead to not war, not military confrontation, but it can lead to some encounters at sea. And also we see that weak governance and failing states or ungoverned space around Indian Ocean. This is adding to the security dynamics of the Indian Ocean. Transnational crime, whether it is the maritime uh, crime trinity of human smuggling, narcotic smuggling and gun running, this is prevalent. And IUU fishing, prevalent. Climate change, prevalent. And also the, the dumping plastic and other, uh, other materials to the ocean is continuing. And also now in the in the next five years, I think the technology, artificial intelligence, cyber, 
all this will play a very very critical role in the indian ocean security dynamic and therefore we all states in the indian ocean has have a responsibility for the future of the economic development of our country for food security for raw material security and even to look for medicine because the ocean is considered as the last frontier to look for medicine now we need all this in the indian ocean for many years to come and therefore we need to think of an inter internationally acceptable governance system to uphold the rule of law in the indian ocean and facilitate equitable benefits to all the indian ocean littoral in a sustainable manner now in this regard in order to do that we really have to have maritime security and maritime safety at the top of our agenda and i have always argued that iora is the best way to proceed in the indian ocean because it encompasses the whole region it it in it, it involves almost all the country except one or two and it is a very good discussion platform it has matured to be what it is today and therefore i believe iora of course when we deal with ocean we have to use uh, unclos we have to uh, be mindful of unclos and one other area with iora unclos and the third area that i like to highlight is the maritime scientific research now that is without understanding what is beneath the ocean we talk about nda now nda when we say it may be the surface of the ocean but what is happening beneath the ocean is also critical for us to know and therefore i would say for indian ocean to be a fair equitable peaceful and prosperous ocean we need to understand the three i uh, we need to understand we need to utilize the three uh, instruments that i mentioned iora unclos and maritime uh, scientific research so then only we can advance maritime safety and maritime security we know that we really are interested because in the indian ocean there is huge asymmetry between countries some countries are very big bigger population bigger military and economic power some countries are quite small so there is a huge asymmetry in the indian ocean among the nation the only way to overcome this asymmetry is to have an international order international rules based order and not to contest to not the contest for power right as long as we have an international rules based maritime order in the indian ocean which would allow the freedom of maritime commerce to take place that is the best thing to do unfortunately there are so many disturbances to this maritime order in the indian ocean by way of strategic competition strategic convergence strate this this two combined has given strategic dilemma for larger number of uh, states in the indian ocean now when you look at the indian ocean there are many initiatives there are many strategies whether it is the usas uh, indo pacific strategy japan's free and open indo pacific strategy then eu strategy then Je uh, france's uh, strategy for indo indian ocean asean strategy german strategy uk strategy australia's strategy but where is indian ocean strategy where is the indian ocean strategy for indian ocean that is my question so that is why i argue the best way to proceed in the indian ocean is through iora we have to make iora happen we have to empower iora to deliver we have to empower iora to address the issues collectively big or small everyone everyone's future in the indian ocean is at stake so unless the indian ocean can get their act together think of the strategies that they want to follow study and understand the issues and find solutions within the indian ocean we will not succeed this is my point there can be 10000 uh, strategies come into the indian ocean from outside but unless we take the ownership of this now in this case i believe india can take a leading role because iora was actually conceptualized by india Uh, together with ions now iora has come of age so we have to make things happen now we need a, a strategy for the region the, through iora is the best uh, strategy that i can think of 
Now, Sri Lanka has been working uh, on this maritime safety and maritime security. We have created a joint working group. We have conducted number of meetings, number of conferences. And now, of course, we are thinking on the second stage of the IORA maritime concept for the future, to make an action plan for the future. Now, conducting workshops, conducting discussions, conducting research work is okay. But unless we translate those action to the sea, that means onto the ground, we are not going to derive any results. So we need to really have a very collaborative framework within the IORA in order to maintain the maritime domain awareness, sharing of information, understand the issues here, understand the problems that we have, understand the limitations, capabilities, and capacities we have, and then work out our strategy for uh, the future of the Indian Ocean. Now, in that, we are now planning for the second IORA action plan. In that, it is critical that we build upon what we have already achieved. We all know what, what the problems are. We have been discussing, and this platform that uh, Primario has organized is one, one such platform where we keep on discussing about the Indian issues in the IORA, Indian Ocean Rim Association region. Let us look at uh, IORA as the Indian Ocean. So we need to build upon what we have identified so far and make them into a work plan. And then having a plan is not going to uh, work unless we have the political decision making support to our plan, the countries, the states have to get together and put their political power, political guidance into the plan. Then we can uh, work together, work towards the second action plan. So we need to we need, we need practical and achievable tasks, and then we need guidance. We need guidance from our political uh, leadership. We need guidance from international organization, and we need to go for high level but measurable goals, then only we can have a meaningful Indian Ocean Rim Association, then only we can understand the security perspectives, then only we can think of the maritime domain awareness, how we expand this to the whole IORA, because we need to facilitate trade and investment across the Indian Ocean. That is our lifeline. Without that, if the maritime trade in the Indian Ocean is interrupted, many countries will be gone. We can't survive. So we need to ensure that maritime trade is continuing. In order for the maritime trade to continue, we need maritime safety and maritime security. Equal measure. We need both at equal measure. We need to pay a lot of attention to these two aspects. And as an entity, then of course, disaster. We never know what is coming our way. We never know what is going to hit next. So we need to be prepared. Now, we have never heard about a pandemic, but last two years, we have been going through that. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, in as I mentioned a little while ago, in order to understand these issues, we need a scientific research-based approach in IORA, whether it is MDA, whether it is anything we do in IORA, we have to have a scientific research-based approach in our day-to-day -day work. So with this, I will conclude my talk. IORA, in my opinion, is the best available platform for Indian Ocean, which is very workable because we do agree that Indian Ocean is critically important. We do agree that we need to maintain the sanctity of the Indian Ocean for the sake of all the countries in the Indian Ocean and the world. So good luck to you and good luck to your deliberations. And thank you once again, Primario, for inviting me. All the very best. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I introduce Captain Himadridas of Indian Navy, Senior Fellow at National Maritime Foundation of New Delhi, who will speak for about 20 minutes on strategies for synergy and cooperation for maritime domain awareness as assimilated from recent workshops or webinars conducted by the National Maritime Foundation, India. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Captain.
Uh, could you confirm that the slides have been loaded and if you can hear me? Yes, sir. We can uh, perfectly see uh, the slide. I'm here you. Thank, uh, you. thank you for that. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. At the outset, my gratitude to the EO Crimario 2 and IFC IOR for inviting me to this important workshop. This actually takes forward a series of joint and independent engagements that the NMF has had with both the organizations. I've had the privilege of a long and close association with both IMAC and IFC IOR even before their formal inception and more recently with EU Crimario. It is indeed special for me to be able to deliver today's talk and continue my long-standing engagements. The task which has been allocated to me is to present the conclusions drawn from two events held in June and October this year. Before I commence, a few words on the events. The first event, a webinar on synergizing MDA and the IOR, the prevailing state of play was held on the 16th of June. Over 180 participants from eight countries participated in the workshop. The panelists and discussants included those from Bangladesh, the EU, India, Maldives, Sri Lanka, and Thailand. In addition, participants also represented countries from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Africa. The second event was the Indian Navy's Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue 2021. The NMF was the Indian Navy's knowledge partner for this event. A panel discussion on cooperative MDA strategies within the Indo-Pacific was held on the 28th of October. The panel discussion witnessed over 270 participants from as many as 24 countries representing five continents. The seven panelists, like the earlier event, represented various subregions in the IOR. Cumulatively, both the events together reflect a wider regional perspective and the multidimensional and multi-layered character of regional cooperation for MDA and information sharing. It will be my endeavor to represent the perspectives of the panelists and participants as accurately as I can. To begin, the need for a regional MDA and information sharing as a precursor for maritime security and for furtherance of a rule-based international order was underscored through both the events. However, it was also recognized that it does come with its share of challenges. It was also underscored that no single country can ensure maritime security, nor can any single country develop MDA. It needs careful attention from each one of us and from all of us. Developing regional cooperation for MDA has multiple dimensions or layers, if you may. Many of these are not readily apparent and are discovered only after scratching the surface. Each dimension has its own sets of challenges, which dialogues like this and the ones before this help, help unravel. After examining multiple models to frame this talk, for today's talk, I will broadly group the discussion under the 10 categories which are flashed. There is no particular ordering other than a desire to develop a logical approach. Moving on to the first, uh, some of the challenges to maritime security and drivers uh, were identified during both the events. The increasing trends in maritime incidents, particularly in some regions, the nexus between different forms of maritime crime, the rise of hybrid threats, capacity constraints in some countries, and the absence of jurisdiction over much of the oceans, particularly in the areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, Admiral Kolambage uh, alluded to this challenge as well uh, a few minutes back. And I think the representative from the UN ODC will provide greater details uh, later in this workshop. A couple of other points are also relevant. First, the right to information in the maritime space is itself circumscribed, necessitating greater collaborative efforts. However, there are challenges in this regard. More about that from the next speaker on the responsibility to share. Second, there are technical challenges and constraints in the monitoring of maritime spaces and maritime activities, such as in the fishery sector, 
which collective efforts seek to overcome. For the purpose of this discussion, capacity building relates to material wherewithal. It emerged that in certain areas like the Western Indian Ocean region, the overall capacity constraints in the region affected the generation of full operational capabilities for both information sharing and for operational response. Strengthening through uh, collaborative efforts. Uh, uh, before, before I, uh, sorry for that break. Before moving ahead, I will uh, make a couple of points. First, capacity building needs to be undertaken at multiple levels. Second, for effective maritime security, there is a need for complementarity in capacity efforts between MDA and information sharing at one end and for operational response at the other. Our discussion today, however, is limited to the former. Some, some possible uh, pathways are now flashed. Broadly with limited budgets and increasing threats, there is a need for pooling of resources for promotion of maritime safety and security. There's a need for greater international efforts at capacity building in MDA and in information sharing. Readily deployable, low-cost, web-based solutions, such as the IORIS platform developed by Crimario, could contribute to facilitating information sharing, both domestically and regionally. Considering the vastness and seamlessness of oceanic spaces and the challenges therein, there is room for multiple engagements and multiple partnerships. Small island states in particular could benefit from complementary, cooperative approaches rather than competitive ones. There's a need for harmonizing international capacity building efforts in consultation with host nations. Solutions which are not wanted should not be imposed. Moving on to capacity enhancement. Capacity enhancement focuses on the capabilities of people and institutions for improving competence and problem solving. It differs from capacity building which essentially focuses on material wherewithal. Some of the ways suggested during the event for capacity enhancement include strengthening cooperation to collaborative efforts in training, co-development of solutions, and in processing of information. Widening engagements of regional countries with information fusion centers through workshops, train the trainer programs, and other similar engagements like, like the one we are having today. The increasing use of the online medium, despite its limitations, is a facilitator to enhance engagements. Attachment of ILOs from partner nations at international fusion centers, such as the IFC IOR. In particular, an attachment of a representative from Primario to the IFC IOR, at least for a short duration for better understanding specific requirements for interoperability was also suggested. Finally, bringing in greater diversity at information centers through multi-sectoral representation also emerged as a way ahead. Uh, this is in addition to naval and uh, Coast Guard representation in such centers. While formal agreements as well as informal partnerships for enhanced information sharing are being progressed, these linkages could be further expanded. Some of the ideas that emerged during uh, the workshops were, Exploring possibilities of enhancing the level of information sharing to include not only track information, but also possibly related data, such as with regards to hazardous cargo. Looking ahead, partnerships could also go beyond white shipping, which in any way is the baseline for information sharing. There is also a need to explore the potential to expand the basket of information sharing agreements, linkages, and partnerships with additional countries and or agencies. Likewise, there was a view that existing bilateral and multilateral mechanisms for cooperation could also be leveraged for information sharing. With the proliferation of information centers and increasing partnerships between them, there is a need for a common coordination platform that facilitates information sharing amongst information centers themselves. The share it framework from Primario could facilitate uh, such coordination.
cooperative efforts were identified as one of the pillars for success of regional MDA, including for providing the operational finish. In unleashing the power of information, it was highlighted that even if there were disparities between partners, aggregated information from multiple sources not only has the potential to significantly enrich MDA, but also result in asymmetric information advantages. In maritime security, every bit and byte counts. Regular engagements bilaterally, regionally, or multilaterally through existing mechanisms and agreements was identified as one of the ways to build greater regional cooperation. Admiral Kolambagi highlighted about the role of the IOR, I, IORA in this regard. Maritime multilateralism was also identified as a way forward. There was also a suggestion for developing coordinating mechanisms to enable regional operational response by national agencies or the development of integrated regional operational capacity wherein individual state capacities are part of a wider regional capacity, such as in the Western Indian Ocean. In addition to the efforts by the IOC, regional constructs such as the IORA, sub-regional constructs such as BIMSTEC and the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium could also facilitate such action. Uh, the IONS has, of course, uh, promulgated the guidelines for HDR operations. Panelists also called for the promotion of synergies in international cooperative efforts to avoid duplication, ensure coherence, and promote complementarities towards optimizing collective efforts. Institutional mechanisms are one of the pillars for maritime security governance. Some panelists were of the view that there is a need for establishing and streamlining or formalizing of domestic MDA structures to further international cooperation in view of the duplication of MDA efforts amongst multiple agencies in some countries. It was however also felt that the lack of robust domestic mechanisms is not prejudicial to regional information sharing. In a similar vein, there is a need for deeper understanding of domestic structures of potential partners for developing partnerships. Several panelists highlighted the need for a whole of government approach to developing an MDA. It was opined that there's a need for greater integration of intelligence sources within information centers towards developing a comprehensive maritime picture. As specific maritime security challenges may require specific approaches, developing thematic information flows are also necessary, both domestically and regionally. Technology has been one of the main drivers for developing MDA and information sharing. Consequently, technology was also discussed at length in both the events. Regional capacity building would continue to be premised on the adaptation of low cost technologies. Commercially available technologies include, including space-based technologies could also be leveraged. There was also uh, a need for compliance with global standards and protocols in software design, such as in the MSIS system to facilitate interoperability. Technological approaches should aim at wider integration of data sources to develop a comprehensive picture, not only of the environment, but also individual elements within the environment. The need to adapt niche, niche technologies was also underscored by some panelists as a key facilitator. Such technologies include amongst others, space, ICT, big data analytics, and AI and ML algorithms, et cetera. Niche technologies will also need to be shared with countries that do not have such technologies. It was also highlighted that there is a need to develop cyber resilience to information sharing systems. It emerged that with increasing underwater challenges, there is a case for expanding the scope of MDA towards better understanding of the underwater domain. Finally, 
Despite the overbearing quest for high technology approaches, it was highlighted that this must not be at the expense of the all available means approach, something which is ingrained in the collision regulations. Moving on to the legal and the conceptual framework, domestic legislative processes was identified as a real quagmire for furthering international cooperation in MDA as legislative processes are long drawn out. It goes without saying that even if legislative processes are not required, bureaucratic processes in democratic countries can be protracted and long winded. Conceptually, it emerged first that there is a need to align efforts at domain awareness to promote furtherance of sustainable development goals, in particular those involving climate change and life below water through data-driven policy making. Second, uh, there was also a need to develop wider consensus among regional information sharing stakeholders, such as in concepts and related terminology. During the discussions, it emerged that in some countries, there was a lack of maritime consciousness among both the political leadership, as well as maritime and coastal communities. Therefore, there's a need to engage, mobilize the or mobilize the political leadership to support international information sharing efforts. Admiral Kolombagi also alluded to this point earlier. Political will was also identified as a necessary attribute to further, uh, to further regional MDA cooperation. Our next speakers will be speaking on the political challenges and uh, uh, I look forward to hearing from this, them in this regard. Several panelists highlighted the need for wider integration of information sharing centers with other maritime stakeholders, such as the shipping industry and the fishing community. Notably, IFC Singapore cited its extensive linkages with the shipping sector as one of its pillars for success. The presence of Captain Subaya from the Indian National Ship Owners Association this morning is testimony to IFC IOR's efforts at wider engagement in, in, in India as well. Panelists also felt that there was a scope for enhancing domestic awareness through track 1.5 and track two engagements amongst key stakeholders, including the national leadership. Enhancing collaboration amongst academic institutions, including universities and think tanks nationally and internationally was also identified as a way ahead. Today's event is an example of such engagements. It also emerged that there was a need to advance scholarship on the legal aspects of information sharing. Moving on to the final and perhaps the most important dimension, trust was identified as a facilitator and enabler for information sharing. In the absence of trust, information sharing mechanisms would be rendered meaningless. In a data-driven world, issues of trust are more relevant today than ever before. Developing trust and demonstrating competence could be achieved through regular and sustained engagements using a mix of tools, such as exercises, both real world and virtual, effective and robust sharing of actionable information using existing agreements, et cetera. And moving on to my final remarks, I have three points to make. First, strengthening regional cooperation in MDA and information sharing needs a multi-dimensional approach and different tools in the toolkit. The requirement is for customized approaches. There is no one size fits all solution. Second, there is a need to sustain dialogue and conversations to first develop understanding and convergences amongst humans before attempt, attempting to develop understanding of the environment itself. Human factors such as trust will continue to shape the dimensions of future engagements. Third, of course, is the need to walk the talk for which Admiral Kolombage made a strong case in his earlier intervention. The continuing success of both Cremario and IFC IOR provide ample proof in this regard. I'm sanguine that the future will be no different. 
with that, I have finished. Many thanks for the patient hearing. My thanks to the organizers once again. Thank you uh, very much, uh, sir. Next, we have a team of two speakers. Mr. Jeffrey Payne from the Near East and South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. And come on, Kevin Duffy, US Coast Guard from Directorate for Strategy, Engagement and Programs, US Africa. In the next 20 minutes, they will dwell on the topic overcoming the political challenge when balancing need to know with responsibility to share. Over to you. Um, well, good evening or good morning here in the East Coast of the United States. Um, my thanks, of course, to the, I the IFC IOR, um, as well to Cremario uh, and to everyone else responsible for putting this on. I'm going to be the first up of the two presentations. I will be sharing my screen um, presently. Um, it should now be up. There we go. Um, so I'm Jeff Payne. I am a faculty member at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, or as all of us in the United States love to make it shorter, NISA. Uh, we cover a wide area of responsibility, but in essence, we cover uh, a great portion of the Indian Ocean Rim. And so our engagement is about reaching out to regional states and figuring out ways to build partnerships, to build cooperation, uh, to build cohesion towards addressing common security threats. The question that was asked of myself and Commander Duffy is the challenge of needing to know versus the responsibility to share, which is a very, very fascinating question. I'm going to approach it more from the data issue, and I think Commander Duffy will approach it more from the traditional operational side of things, um, given his, uh, his, his deep expertise in that arena. But I think to answer the question about needing to know versus sharing data, it's, it's really about a methodology, it, and, and that is my point here tonight, is if you look at the maritime domain 50 years ago, the issue was there was an absence of data. So there was a shroud over everything. Today, no matter if you're a country that does not have uh, immense capabilities technologically, or you're a country with all the technological tools you can dream of, we are all suffering from an avalanche of data. There is so much data out there, we don't know if it's reliable, we don't know if we can integrate it, we don't know how to necessarily use it to alter or improve our operations, and this is a common problem and something we hear constantly in our engagements throughout the Indian Ocean, uh, whether we're dealing, talking with our friends in Oman or talking with our friends in India, talking with our friends along the Eastern coast of Africa. It's all a common frame of data. We need to know how to navigate data. We need to, we need to help on working through the data. And so the point here is we are on a cusp of a data revolution for the maritime domain. The amount of entities in the private sector and organizations in the public and non-state sector that are working on navigating the data sources for the maritime domain is really revolutionary in what it's going to bring. Um, there's going to be more and more tools available that, that can take data sets and give us real data that we can make operational choices on, that policymakers can build better strategies or better guidance for maritime services. We're not there yet, we're on the cusp of it. And organizations like Cremario with its IOR system is an example of this. But the, related to the data question is the policy implication of a closed versus an open system. And this is something that states struggle with. We are either from the military service or from a police service or from a Coast Guard. And we, we are trained inherently by our organizations to protect data. And we extend that into the digital space. But if you look at the state prevalence for wanting to close off data and share it with little drops here and there versus the private sector in the technological domain, which is really about an open system, you have to make a determination about what kind of data you want, how you want to use it, and how you want to protect it. A closed system is inherently more protected until it's breached. And then all bets are off. 
So this, think about it in terms of a vessel, think about it in terms of a common database or port authority. An open system has a lot of different vulnerability points, but the way it's constructed inherently makes it more resilient to breaches. And this is something that we in the, in the civil services and the military services do not talk a lot about, but the technological side of things does all the time. And that's a major policy question that's overhanging this question, this larger question of need to know versus responsibility to share. Being a common thread from the previous speakers, realizing that parallel tracks are our future. There will not be uniformity in the near future. Everyone is gonna pursue different ways of processing data and sharing data. That is not going to be a problem in the short term. We need to continue that, we need to energize that, we need to participate in that and lend our, our expertise and our time to it. A lot of the data is going to address in the immediate way, asymmetric and non-state challenge sets. Smugglers, traffickers, IUU. This is where the building blocks for a comprehensive maritime information sharing data set is going to be kind of built. And then finally, a point I wanna make is the recognition that there will be growing pains. There will be replication of data. Um, we know we don't want that, but it will happen. Um, because countries are going to experiment. They're going to build off something that already exists. So we need to recognize that. But the overall point here is that the responsibility to share will come along as this quilt of connectivity is built. Connectivity and person-to-person -person exchanges, connectivity on the seas, and connectivity with data. And so that's the main point I wanted to make uh, with my brief presentation. Here are some of my data um, if you want to reach out to, uh, to myself um, for further questions, I will now turn it over to Commander Duffy uh, and my thanks for your time and for the invitation. All right, good morning and uh, thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to, uh, to be here this morning to present. I will share my screen now. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be presenting on the topic of um, multilateral approaches to coordinating maritime security efforts. Uh, it's a topic I feel <clears throat> gets to the heart of the themes of this particular workshop. Uh, having worked with partner nation maritime forces on uh, five continents over the past 20 years, I've come to value multilateral interoperability as a cornerstone of any successful maritime security efforts. So I consider it a privilege to give this overview. Moreover, I've come to learn that the balance between sharing amongst partners and maintaining individual national control on issues as important as sovereignty and asset tasking is generally at the heart of all of our challenges in cooperating for effective operations at sea. It's important to note that I'll be presenting on a small and selected number of multinational coordinating mechanisms. And this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but rather a representative sample that demonstrates how several different considerations may lead international coalitions to select different models for their cooperative efforts. As you'll see, these considerations are geographic, political, legal, and operational, and they're all critical. I contend that these, the, the considerations that I'm about to uh, present, are the standard considerations we should take into account when designing future mechanisms. <clears throat> Specifically, I'll be, I'll be highlighting the structure and operations of Combined Task Force 151, Counter Piracy Task Force operating off the Somali coast, Joint Interagency Task Force South, or JIADF, Counter Trafficking Command operating in the waters around South and Central America and the Caribbean. The Yoande Architecture, a multi mission but piracy focused agreement and network of command centers addressing West African maritime security. The Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia, or RECAP. This is a regional information sharing agreement that covers a wide swath of waters in and around Asia. And finally, the Regional Maritime Information Fusion Center, or RMIFC, located in Madagascar and focusing on information sharing and intelligence fusion for the Western Indian Ocean, and likely very familiar to this group. Now, why have we selected these five particular multilateral frameworks? It's because to me, they really highlight how different factors shape what kind of coordinating mechanisms are created. I've, list I've listed those factors uh, along the left, so left side of the table here. They include the sea space, the actors involved, the mission or missions, and whether or not the entity is designed to exercise a command and control or C2 function. 
That is whether or not a centralized command can, can direct the activities of the assigned assets. So for CTF 151, we see that we have a relatively small and simple operating space with a designated transit corridor for protected traffic and no real issues with territorial seas or sovereignty concerns. Moreover, the adversary is reliably non-state and lacks central control, while the task force itself has a strictly defined and narrow counter piracy mission and robust command and control under which there is centralized direction of assigned assets. This is a maximum control and minimum complexity situation. For Jayadav, one column over, the operating area is far larger, encompassing all of South and Central America, with individual states' territorial waters and partner forces' inability to enter those waters involved. Moreover, while the adversary, uh, drug traffickers essentially, is non-state and generally disorganized, there are some major coordinating actors in an adversarial role, namely the major drug cartels. The mission for Jayadav is again highly specific, with a counter-trafficking focus. While they have a fairly robust tactical control of assigned assets, their C2 is less than that of CTF-151 because many states are operating in their own territorial waters or pursuant to their own state's policies on the high seas when they make an interdiction. Looking at the Yuande architecture, again, one column over to the right, <clears throat> we still see uh, quite a large operating area and one that is highly complex in terms of converging territorial waters and sovereignty, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. To make coordination manageable, the Yuande architecture imposes a structure of five coordinating zones running north to south. Their adversary is again non-state, mostly pirates operating in an only loosely coordinated fashion. While there is a clear counter-piracy focus though, this is a multi-mission coordinating mechanism, so their mission set is broader than the previous two entities mentioned. And unlike those first two entities, there's no actual C2 function here. There's a strong and well-defined architecture with the previously mentioned zones, and actual multinational, regional, and interregional command centers to coordinate activities. But it's just coordination. There is no directive function in the architecture. So individual states main, maintain control of their own assets. Our MIFC and RECAP, they're two separate and distinct entities covering different areas, uh, but I'll lump them together here for time's sake. Both cover very large areas of ocean and seek to counter mostly non-state adversaries. While RECAP has a strong counter piracy focus and our MIFC seeks to address a wider range of threats, both serve essentially as information coordination centers only with no aim of or actual authority to exercise any type of command and control at all. At most, intelligence fusion and sharing along with domain awareness are the main goals. So in conclusion, we can see that varying problem sets and regions demand and result in different multilateral coordinating structures. The key takeaways then are the factors to consider when formulating new multilateral maritime security entities. I would summarize these factors as, defining the sea space, both physically and politically. Are there converging territorial seas or is it all high seas? Are there maritime straits, choke points or other particular risk areas? Defining the actors to include the willingness and capabilities of partners and the potential roles of external stakeholders. What is the nature of the adversary? Are they economic opportunists? Do they want to smuggle goods or people? Do they kidnap for ransom or board by force to steal cargo or other goods? Where do they go when they flee a scene? And defining our mission and purpose. Is it merely to share information, to fuse intelligence or to provide awareness? Or is there a command and control function envisioned? How much directive authority are various participants willing to cede to the group? Will they be open to having their assets directed by a central command authority or merely to coordination process that provides the information needed for them to make their own decisions under their uh, own given national authorities? How much information or intelligence are they willing to share with the broader coalition of participants? With the answers to these fundamental questions in hand, I believe that willing partners can build the right multilateral framework to address their maritime security challenges, whatever and wherever they may be. So that concludes my comment. I look, look forward to uh, questions in the Q&A session later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sirs. Now we have Mr. Joshua Gonzalez from the UN Office for Drugs and Crime. Global Maritime Crime Program, UNODC, GMC. Over the next 20 minutes, he will talk on information sharing among members 
with special emphasis on challenges in maritime domain. Also, the next part of the workshop will be conducted by my teammate, Lieutenant Commander Ashok Varma, Operations Officer at IFC IOR. Over to you, Mr. Gonzalez. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen now. Just a second. Yeah, let me know if you can see it. Yes, yeah, yeah, can visible. someone let me know? Screen is visible, yeah, okay, yes. Perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity given to you and ODC. Um, as it has been mentioned, my name is Joshua Arteta Gonzalez. I am an associate program officer for the Global Maritime Crime Program of UNODC. I am currently based in the Maldives, so um, some of my examples uh, will be will be a, a little bit biased, but I will speak about uh, the challenges and opportunities um, on MDA in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, I will explain a bit about uh, the role of the GMCP, Global Maritime Crime Program of UNODC. Um, I will explain our approach so far on MDA, uh, what we are looking or what we're looking to do uh, um, or to support the, the, the Indian Ocean states that we cover here. And then we talk about the challenges and opportunities. So um, just to provide a little bit of a background on what the Global Maritime Crime Program does, GMCP, uh, GMCP is the maritime arm or branch of UNODC. Uh, we have eight regional teams and I belong to, um, let me see if I can just move it here. Yes, um, I belong to this team over here, the Indian Ocean East team. Uh, currently is headquarters in Colombo, Sri Lanka, but I am uh, representing the, the program in Maldives. So we uh, started uh, MDA activities uh, a couple of years ago, and we are still uh, developing our our offer to the to the different law enforcement agencies and government entities here in in the Indian Ocean. But uh, some of the core activities that GMCP uh, delivers are related to law enforcement uh, and everything related to um, how to detect and identify illicit activity at sea, um, how to investigate, how to produce evidence packages. Uh, to ensure successful prosecution. And we also work with the corrections to ensure that prisoners are treated in, in accordance to UN human rights uh, instruments. And most importantly, which has been hampered by uh, COVID-19, is uh, our initiatives, initiatives on regional cooperation. Uh, we unfortunately haven't been able to run many, many uh, international or regional activities. We have managed to do some, but it's, 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 uh, it's a a core um, activity that we that we envision. So if you see on the right side of this slide, I try to to portray here sort of the line that um, or or the yeah sort of the a timeline so to speak of what we are looking to do. This over here is an MTA system. Um, and it's just as I put here as an example of um, how we. As you know, DC tried to encourage um, law enforcement agencies and other government agencies to use MDA systems to spot, spot um, illicit activity at sea through various mechanisms. So then they can move on to um, inform law enforcement operations. Uh, and this is part of a, a, our vessel search training for Maldives Customs. Or for instance, this over here, which is a training for the Maldives Coast Guard on VBSS, Visit Board Search and Seizure, um, maritime interdictions basically, and um, to eventually move to prosecution. And this is another training delivered by UNODC on international maritime law. So what we try to do is to use MDA and connect it to the entire criminal justice uh, chain. So our approach to MDA, as I was mentioning, is to use MDA as a way to not only detect illegal behavior, but also to ensure legal finish. So this is no news for all the attendees here, but I just wanted to, to present this slide because I think it's very, it's very easy to understand and it's very straightforward. Um, and I have heard other speakers talk about the importance of data, but there's a whole set of data that can be used 
Uh, but it's not enough when it comes to MDA. It needs to be processed, it needs to be analyzed. So MDAs, uh, MDA systems or integration systems and the maritime uh, fusion centers are uh, one of the most important tools that uh, governments and law enforcement agencies have to process all this incredibly huge amount of uh, information to not only you know have it on on screens and in in in, in um, fusion uh, fusion systems but also have the human factor in it the operators inputs the intelligence uh, that has been gathered so far about specific um, illegal behavior to then act so this is sort of the the um, the um, the line that we like to that, that we would like to engage or re-engage uh, with the governments when it comes to MDA. So this is this timeline over here is uh, is uh, another example of that. We go from detection to interdiction to investigation to prosecution, and I I would like to highlight two of these detection and lessons learned, because um, it's not just enough to have MDA systems that are used to detect. Uh, illicit activity at sea and uh, when these have informed interdictions and when these have led to investigations and when these investigations have produced enough evidence to be then sent to prosecution the law enforcement agencies and government agencies need to monitor the outcomes of all these uh, uh, efforts to then sit down and say, what did we do wrong? What did we do right? What can we replicate? And what we have seen so far in the Indian Ocean is that sometimes this does not happen. Maybe international um, cooperation is there, and I will pr uh, provide examples of that in a minute. But when it comes to um, uh, speaking internally uh, between agencies inside each country, this, uh, this is an important part that is currently not taking place as we would uh, like to see it. So this is this is an important part that is also linked to MDA. So regarding the MDA situation today in, in the Indian Ocean, this is no news to you, I, I believe, but I wanted to uh, provide some examples of how MDA can be useful in these cases. So drug trafficking is no secret for anyone that is, uh, is one of the major uh, uh, phenomena in, in the Indian Ocean. And COVID has sparked that, and we have fear um, uh, on what's going to happen uh, with the, the drugs produced in Afghanistan and so on. But um, here, uh, in this image over here on the left corner, um, you can see uh, these are packages of drug packages um, that were confiscated by uh, the Maldives Police Service a couple of months ago. And this was an example of international collaboration between India and Maldives. Um, I was informed that India was uh, provided some information to the Maldives authorities. Uh, and that's why the Maldives authorities were able to act and 100 kg of heroin were seized in this operation. Um, in the next case would be illegal fishing. And uh, of course, MDA systems are one of the best tools when, um, when it comes to IUU fishing. Um, and particularly uh, the, all the features that uh, MDA systems can provide when it comes to, for instance, uh, setting marine protected areas as, you know, set alerts when it comes to fish, uh, sorry, uh, fishing uh, vessels going into those areas, how to monitor those areas to prevent illegal fishing from happening. So in this image over here, this, um, this is also a, 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 an ongoing case, uh, I believe, in the, in the Maldives. And I'm sorry about all the examples from the Maldives, but it, it helps to illustrate uh, the points. It, this, these are shark fins that were confiscated at an airport, and all of these were uh, caught in Maldives waters. So even though the seizing took place or the seizure took place in an airport, uh, this is clearly in the maritime space, and um, uh, government agencies should pay attention to these kind of uh, um, incidents because. Uh, the total amount of shark fins that were confiscated in this case were uh, over 400 kg, and the amount of uh, the uh, of sharks that uh, had to be killed to produce this amount of um, uh, shark fins is is considerable. So um, uh, it's, it's not a small uh, illegal fishing case. It, it's it's a it's a much bigger criminal. Uh, investigation that needs to take place needs to take place. So MDA can also help in these cases. 
Uh, the next example is maritime terrorism, and I, I, I heard one of the speakers talk about maritime terrorism. It's it, in in demand. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a um, it's a good let's say um, example as well. Uh, because Maldives is mostly a maritime country, it's a, it's an archipelago, and 99% of its territory is water. So, basically, most of the things that happen in Maldives are in water. So, this is another example of um, some uh, boat arson that took place in Ma Maldives um, uh, to last year, where um, some law enforcement assets were uh, set ablaze. ablaze. So. Um, this is another example where MDA can be useful uh, and link it to other kinds of security um, systems like CCTV systems to monitor peers and yetis and so on. So um, it's, it, 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 the, um, the different uh, uh, mechanisms in which MDA systems can be used, it, it, it pretty much depends on the, on the kind of, of incident that takes place. And lastly, not to extend myself too much, this uh, example over here, um, it's uh, the uh, Sri Lankan ex -pearl, uh, Express Pearl in Negombo, um, which is a very clear example of, of what can happen if uh, um, uh, vessels are not monitored, and especially in countries like Sri Lanka and um, Maldives, where uh, uh, an incident like this can cost uh, the economy uh, can, can put a cost in the, in the economy very, very hardly. So um, moving on and uh, well, still on the MDA situation today, um, based on these incidents, we have noticed that uh, the government agencies, relevant government agencies, uh, are they still have a limited MDA knowledge and capabilities. Some people, some uh, agencies that we have been contacting in uh, some of the countries that we work on have been just exposed to MDA uh, or wh whatever that means. So um, there's uh, a lot to be done uh, when it comes to presenting the different options, the different possibilities. There are many uh, possibilities when it comes to MDA systems. Uh, and I'm not an MDA, an MDA expert, but I know that it's not just about having uh, robust digital systems, but also training the people, ch checking indicators, checking rendezvous, and so on. So um, that's one of the of the main uh, challenges. Then uh, interagency cooperation is low or done on a case by case basis. So this is what I was mentioning before. The uh, maybe international cooperation take place and maybe it needs to be improved. But what UNODC has been focusing uh, on much more is to try to put the agencies together. UNODC has provided or facilitated spaces where the Coast Guard, the Navy, the police, the fisheries, uh, transport, environmental protection agencies, and so on, they sit together and they look at MDA as a tool that they can all use from their respective mandates and missions. And th this needs to take place, especially in those uh, legis uh, sorry, jurisdictions where uh, the resources are scarce or um, manpower is limited. So this has been one of our main uh, purposes. And lastly, um, there's in many of these cases, there's an inexistent or unutilized plans or SOPs when it comes to responding to maritime incidents. So in many cases, we see that um, it, it's done on a, on a reactive uh, manner instead of being more proactive and using MDA as a way to prevent things from happening. Um, so in addition to this, there are some SOPs, some plans that have been developed between agencies to encourage uh, working together, but they have not been operationalized. So we have, we have been also working on that. But as I mentioned, there is ongoing international cooperation between South Asian countries, uh, specifically in this part of the world. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Maldives hosted the Dosti exercise between India, Sri Lanka, and Maldives, and they conducted a several uh, a series of maritime exercises that uh, encourage uh, officers and um, heads of agencies to get to know each other, to to you know break the ice and ex start changing exchanging more information. So um, very quickly, UNO Disease Assistance has focused in assessing what are the MDA needs at the national level in Bangladesh, Maldives, and Sri Lanka, which are the, the countries that we focus on in this, in this regional team. 
uh, we have uh, presented different MDA systems to uh, the different agencies. So for the Coast Guard, for instance, we focus on law enforcement, but for the fisheries, we present uh, the trainings in a, in a different kind of way because they would use it for fisheries crimes. So, and so on with different agencies. Um, we have also provided, and we have the possibility to provide equipment to enhance MDA capabilities. So it's not just about knowing how to use it, but um, we procure computers, laptops, screens, and uh, any other kind of uh, um, uh, equipment that can be used when it comes to increasing MDA capability, also operationally, so maybe communications equipment as well. We have done training and mentoring, and as I said before, we have facilitated spaces for um, interagency communication and collaboration at the national level so far. And this is my last slide um, and opportunities that uh, we as UNODC um, envision. We will continue to encourage the use of MDA uh, systems among different agencies beyond Coast Guards and beyond law enforcement, sorry, navies, and beyond law enforcement. As I said, it's, it's different kinds of um, maritime activities, different kinds of um, uh, dynamics at sea that can be prevented or tackled if more agencies can access MDA systems. And we also uh, see that there's a possibility to enhance the capacity of existing and prospective maritime information fusion centers. I know this is an idea of uh, many of the countries in the Indian Ocean, uh, and there are many fusion centers already in place. I know that um, there have been uh, international liaison officers in the different centers. This needs to continue to grow and more international exchanges need to take place. Um, or if, if it doesn't exist in, in specific countries, then find a way to support them, to, for them to establish it because it would, it would provide the space for other agencies to join as well. We will, uh, we will see that there's a need to, co to continue training and mentoring. And one of the main uh, outcomes of one of our engagements this year is the possibility of establishing maritime task forces. If there is a dedicated task force that has all these different agencies talking to each other, designated um, focal points and so on, it would facilitate communication between them, which ultimately will um, um, ensure that MDA is, is utilized in the best way possible using the um, current resources. That's all for me. Thank you very much. This is my information over here. Um, over to you, sir. Thank you very much for the succinct brief, sir. I am uh, Lieutenant Commander Ashok Verma, the Operations Officer at IFC Iowa, and will be conducting the next part of the workshop. Unfortunately, Captain Burton has handed over, uh, has put me in a fix because our next speaker, Mr. Morad Gobel from the International Maritime Organization, could not join us in person today. He has have been very kind and has sent us a pre-recorded brief on the International Maritime Organization's Global Integrated Shipping Information System. Its scope, utility, how it helps shared awareness and challenges faced in synergizing efforts. I would request my co-organizers at Crimario to share the presentation now. Thank you. Um. Could you see the presentation? Yes, uh, we can see it, but not in full screen. Uh, maybe you can start the slideshow. And uh, do you you don't you don't see the the the, the screen? Uh, we see the screen, uh, but uh, you can start the slideshow. Okay. very happy today to be with you in uh, this presentation of the Kisses database, and especially the security. Uh, the audio is not very clear. Maybe uh, you can increase the volume, please. Uh, 
ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon. It depends on where you are. I'm very happy today to be with you to deliver this presentation on the GIZIS database and especially the security model. Before starting, let me introduce myself. My name is Murat Gorben. I'm working at the Maritime Safety Division within the International Maritime Organization as a technical officer dealing with the technical assistance to be provided to member states. So, in our presentation, we will take an overview on how to access the IMO Global Integrated Shipping Information System, GIZIS, and particularly the maritime security and piracy and armed robbery modules. Also, we will see how and who is responsible for maintaining the information on the database and what type of information need to be uploaded to this database. So the Global Integrated Shipping Information System, GIZIS, was launched by the IMO Secretariat in 2005 with double objectives. The first is, is to enable a direct reporting by member states in compliance with existing new requirement, namely what is required by SOLAS Chapter 11.2, and also to access to data compiled by the Secretariat. To access to GIZIS, we have two login options. Login as a member, and it is editable, and you can add or delete some information, okay. and login as a public user, and this enable the user to read only without being able to modify any data. The Global Integrated Shipping Information System include about 32 modules that vary from maritime security, marine casualty and incidents, status of treaties, port state control, piracy and armed robbery, language identification tracking data distribution plan, ship particulars, contact points, reception facilities, IMDG code, and so on. But in our presentation, we will focus only on the maritime security model and the piracy and armed robbery model. So for the maritime security model, here the address that we can log in to this module. And uh, the information that included within this module is the information communicated, communicated under the provision of SOLAS Regulation 13 of Chapter 11.2 and the ISPS code also. So for the maritime security model, An effective international application of the maritime security measure is dependent on the maintenance of strong communication links and liaison between port facility and ship operator on the one hand, and the national contact points to which they can express security concerns and from which they can seek security advice on the other. That's why governments are required to provide IMO with up-to-date information on the points of contact of their national authorities. So the question now, who is responsible for giving those information and updating or keeping update those information? Under the maritime security measure, government are required to provide IMO with the contact details of the national official of maritime security, 
authorized recognized security organization and their specific responsibilities and the designated PAR facilities including security contact details usually the PAR facility security officer this information can be provided using the IMO web-based database GIZIS, and should be kept updated the information on the PAR facility security plan should be updated at least every five years. So the Regulation 13 of SOLAS Convention, Chapter 11-2, said that the contracting government shall, no later than 1st July 2004, communicate to the organization and shall make available for the information of companies and ships the names and contact details of their national authority or authority responsible for ship and port facilities. The location within their maritime domain covered by approved port facility security plan. Regulation 13. The names and contact details of those who have been designated to be available at all times to receive and act upon the ship to shore security alerts referred to in regulation 6.2.1 and the names and contact details of those who have been designated to be available at all times to receive and act up on any communication from contracting government exercising control and compliance measure referred to in regulation 9.3.1. The name and finally the names and contact details of those who have been designated to be available at all times to provide assistance to ships and to whom ships can report any security concern referred to in regulation 7.2. And finally, the next. So in this slide, you can see how the GIZIS maritime security module look. So when you access to the maritime security module, you will find the first page that is data on the status of compliance. And you have two options to select the state or the territory or to do a quick search if you know, for example, the name of port or the port facility or the IMO port facility number, so you can directly search data related to this port. So, so we can take an example so that it will be clear how we can use this website. So if you, so we select the Trinidad and Tobago state and we'll ask or click on the organizational contact and we will select all type of contacts to be displayed, we will find the following. So we can take an example. So we will have the contact details of the national authority responsible for ship security. For our cases and our country, it is Marine Ship Safety and Port Facility Security Unit. We'll find the national authority responsible for ship security, the national authority responsible for port facility security. And as you, as you noted here, there is two entities dealing with the security of ships the Marine Ship Safety and Port Facility Security Unit and the Maritime Service Division, Ministry of Works and Transport. And for the National Authority responsible for Port Facility Security, it is declared Marine Ship Safety and Port Facility Security Unit. And always with the Trinidad and Tobago, and if we would like to have more details about the national authority responsible for ship security, we will click 
on it and this is what can be displayed on the screen. So what is the first name, the last name, the title, the post, the address, the postcode, the phone, the fax, mobile, email, and so on. Now, for the same selected country, if we like to inquire about the port facilities, we will click on port facilities and the list of ports will be displayed. So we have to select the appropriate port and we ask for search. Now, so once we selected already the port, the list of port facilities can be displayed. So we will select the port facilities within this port and we will click on it. So once we, so once we selected the port facility, a page will be displayed and it contains the port facility details, the port facility name, the IMO port facility mm -hmm. number, the port facility description, that is, for example, all supply bases, tankers, containers, the latitude and the longitude, and after that, some information related to the security plan. So, the port facility has alternative security agreement, yes or no? The port facility has approved the equivalent security arrangement, yes or no? The port facility has approved port facility security plan, and in most cases, yes. For our case, yes. And if it is yes, the date of port facility security plan approval, and this is the date of the first approval to be in compliance with the ISPS code. And the date of most recent review or approval of the port facility security plan. And the date of most recently issued statement of compliance, if applicable. Because as you know, the statement of compliance is not a mandatory provision. So the member state may issue it of compliance. And the last is, has the port facility security plan been withdrawn? Yes or no? The, the, the last uh, area is related to the maritime security point of contact. Uh, in the most of case, the PFSO. So it is the name, the address, and the contact details of this PFSO or the person responsible of the security of this port facility. So the national points of contact of the GIZIS maritime security models, the details of those national points of contact and details of port facility must be submitted to the IMO in accordance with SOLAS Regulation 13 of Chapter 11.2 on communication of information to be promulgated on the IMO website. And making change to the information within the maritime security module of IMO GIZIS databases is the responsibility of the designated national point of contact for each member state. So the national So circular letter 3338 contains a form that can be used to nominate a national point of contact for GIZIS maritime security module. This form shall be sent via email to marsecimo.org and marsecimo will give or will provide a password to the national point of contact in order to enable him to access to this model and to be able to enter data or delete data or update data related to the security model. This was another view of the GIZIS maritime security model with its organizational contact facilities, security arrangement, 
and also the national focal point that is required to keep the information up to date. And based on the information provided in Gizis as of 27 February 2018, only 28% of all registered poor facilities require an update of the security related information currently available particularly as regards review or approval of the port facility security plan at five years interval as required by chapter 11.2 regulation 13.4 of SOLAS construction. For that, I invite you as a representative of your member states to communicate the required information to I'm using this GIZI's website, Maritime Security Module. Thank you very much for your attention. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Mr. Gobel for taking the efforts of recording this presentation and to Miss Isabel, our colleague from Kimario, for handling the technical curveball. I'm sure that the audience will appreciate that uh, such an online workshop is never really truly underway without a few technical glitches. Moving on to the next part, may I now introduce Captain N. Subaya from the Indian National Ship Owners Association. Over the next 20 minutes, he will present an industry perspective to securing the maritime domain. Over to you, Captain Subir. Good day to all. Can you hear? And uh, can I have the presentation, please? We can hear you fine, sir. We'll just be getting the presentation on top. Yeah, first of all, I thank uh, IFC, IOR, and Primario for giving INSA, Indian National Ship Owners Association, an opportunity to share our view. I'm Captain Subaya, uh, working presently with Sanma Shipping, now representing Indian National Ship Owners Association. While we wait for the presentation, uh, we can broadly classify the threats in maritime industry into five categories. The piracy and kidnapping, armed robbery, thefts, smuggling and irregular human migration. Can we go to the next slide and uh, can it be put on presentation mode, please? Thank you. So like I explained, uh, there are five broad categories we can uh, classify these threats. And uh, while it is important to address all the threats, from the ship owner's perspective, the most important threat is uh, ensuring the safety of crew members. And we need to take the view of uh, seafarers and their perspective while addressing this forum. The other points of uh, priority are securing, securing national interest in critical supply chain and the commercial aspect. We all have uh, access to the data related to the piracy incidents. I have taken data for the last six years related to crew safety. We can see in the last five years, more than 150 piracy attacks every year on merchant ships. And uh, the, hot, the violence to crew is almost 200 every year. 200 seafarers are facing a violent terrorist or pirate every year. The data given here for 2021 is uh, till September, and uh, hopefully it is on a slightly declining trend. You will see the kidnap increased uh, in year 2019 and 2020. Actually, it started increasing in 2018 last quarter. This is mainly due to the increased activities in Gulf of Guinea area. The hostage, number of hostages is also high. People getting injured, seafarers getting injured, almost uh, six, seven, eight in that number. And worst of all, there are people who are dying. Even in 2021, there was one death. All these data actually does not cover what the seafarers go through. 
the people who underwent attack uh, they go through trauma during their entire life and there are so many other uh, uh, issues like uh, the seafarers transiting in hra as always under you know tremendous tension they are always on guard and uh, tremendous tension i would like to analyze the present scenario in different areas of uh, sea uh, the threat perceived in that area from our perspective the challenges faced by the seafarers and the ship owners positive impact which we have already achieved from existing or the upcoming initiatives and uh, the suggestions for the further improvement i'll go to the next slide now first uh, we will cover the area in east coast of africa indian ocean but uh, specific to east coast of africa can we go to the next slide please so the indian ocean especially east coast of africa the number of piracy incidents are dramatically reduced and in the last two years almost nothing attempted theft uh, was in one case of attempted theft in 2021 and in 2022 both these incidents occurred at a vessel at anchor at the mozambique uh, anchorage the extraordinary positive situation Uh, has happened only because of uh, efforts from international navy and various government bodies thanks to them there is a lot of uh, information sharing and uh, guidance to the vessel earlier we have seen combined task force uh, from i think 30 plus uh, nations were controlling that area and uh, giving help to the merchant navy vessels it is really a great relief to seafarers and the owners who are uh, you know peaceful trading in that area we can see the reduction in hra first it happened in may 2019 and again recently in september 2021 the september 2021 limit has come so close that a vessel which is uh, leaving fujaira and proceeding towards south africa or coming from india to south africa their normal course is uh, more or less outside the hra limit so this has created a good situation uh, most of the ships trading in that area need not carry armed guards this has already become a practice uh, armed guard carriage is very very less probably the ships which are calling uh, somalian ports or uh, nearby like mombasa they only need to carry the armed guards only thing we need to be careful about uh, in this area east coast of africa is uh, complacency because we understand from the intelligence the somali pirates still hold the capability to mount attack at any any time and recently in august 21 there was an attempt on roro passenger vessel antolian so for seafarers and the ship owners compliance with best management practices participating in the reporting system and keeping a good watch are uh, the important things to do there is another threat of uh, stowaways especially in south african ports and some of the east african ports but i think uh, we have good countermeasures if we take uh, precautions it is possible like placing on local guards or carrying out a search using show team we have seen the search by docks are uh, quite effective in south africa but next i will move on to gulf of uh, guinea this is the most worrisome yeah, for the seafarers and the ship owners in the last few years the number of kidnaps and the violent methods adopted by the pirates are making many seafarers dread going to that area pirates actually attack sometimes in a secured anchorage very close to the territorial waters and uh, they can even attack something like 200 220 miles from the territorial waters this is actually unbelievable what people are going through the seafarers or owners in the past uh, i was in the team handling one such case and i would like to give my first hand experience uh, what the seafarers went through and what the owners went through in that incident the pirates in that area they have tremendous knowledge on ships their movement they have a particular movement about ship and they plan very very well at what moment they have to attack probably they have some contacts in the local network they also gather information about the specific ship which they are going to attack uh, in this case they knew about the critical missionary they knew exactly where the main power switch for ship security alarm system or the 
communication equipment. So within a minute of boarding, they cut off the entire communication system and uh, the ship was not possible. We, we couldn't raise the ship for a few days till they actually discharged the cargo and they contacted through their own channels. Many of the pi <coughs> pirates are uh, ex-seafarers. They know how to operate the ship. In fact, uh, they could uh, maneuver the ships. They could discharge a cargo, part of the cargo through double banking without even a single help from seafarers. And uh, in two cases, like uh, we have seen, the team, pirates team form in the last minute. They are not a proper uh, team. They, it's all gathered from here and there, some seafarers, some terrorists. And once they complete the discharge and, the, and they start communicating with various teams for uh, their ransom, uh, time to time they get into quarrel, probably because of mistrust and who is going to take the money and all that. And whenever they get angry, entire anger is shown on the seafarers. In this case, the seafarers time to time were collected in one place, tied up and told that it, within one hour, if you are not going to get the money, you will not be here. And they, it, exact that time, there used to be random shooting. Luckily, in that case, no one got injured. But it is a horrible scenario for the seafarers. And uh, when they attempt to kidnap, they have uh, high speed boats. They claim that the local people do not have such uh, fast speed boats available in their Navy in that entire area. So if there is a chance, they take the people for ransom to deep forest in uh, Niger Delta. That area is uh, horrible. The people who have been caught there and spent uh, some, some people have spent one week before they were released, some even up to 30 days. They say it's an inhuman condition in which they live during that time. There were deaths during such uh, captivity. I still remember finally when we secured the vessel and the crew and the first person to board the vessel, I still cannot forget the reactions of the crew. They were not sleeping inside the accommodation. They were all standing outside. Any small impact noise which is coming, they used to get scared that it is going to be some shooting and all that. Not to mention the family members. The family members also go through tremendous uh, pressure. There are critical nature of information which they cannot pass on during the phase till they are released. If they go out to the open forum, that uh, gives an added advantage to the pirates. So they get information from a very, very narrow channel and uh, horrible situation again for them. Again, coming to the owner's perspective, the owners also go through a terrible time and their ordeal doesn't stop when they secure the ship and the seafarers. It continues for a very long time. First of all, when the pirates get down, they damage the vessel and the machinery in such a way that uh, the vessel cannot move. So when uh, to reactivate the vessel, you know, make the machinery in uh, operational condition, assess the situation, there are a lot of gunshots, they repair everything, it takes a huge amount of uh, time. And to add on to that uh, thing, the oil majors put a hold on the vessel. So the vessels are not ready for trading until the root cause analysis is done. And uh, the oil majors or the various parties, including insurance, they all start investigating. So more of a fault finding, we feel all seafarers for their own safety, especially in uh, dealing in HRA, they take uh, measures like uh, complying with best management practices. Irrespective of all efforts taken, the pirates have got the capability and intelligence and local support to board the vessel. They have to be a sort of, uh, you know, uh, approached empathetically to you know, relieve their tension. Owners also have got another problem. There will be a local investigation from police or other authorities. The crew has to give the information to them. But before getting down or before releasing them, the pirates tend to uh, threaten the crew that we are monitoring you till you leave this place. And uh, the moment you start giving information, we will have that information and we will chase you down wherever you are. So the owners have to balance it between supporting uh, the incident investigation and at the same time ensuring safety of the crew and uh, till they reach their you know, loved ones. The other challenges in this area is uh, very peculiar the guards are not allowed to be taken from outside. For example, if a vessel goes to Red Sea, it takes uh, off Fujairah, it can take uh, armed guard from a very good company and it can transit uh, Gulf of Aden.
But here the ships coming to West Africa cannot take uh, pirate, the armed guards from uh, South Africa or Mediterranean. At least recently, they started giving the escort boats from uh, 200 miles, uh, Nigeria and Cameroon, they started that. That is uh, some saving. But uh, allowing guards from outside will be a very good help. And there is no Ill, uh, in local, local support available. Like for example, uh, chopper, you want, you are in trouble, you want a chopper, there is a capability is not there. Speed boats are not available. But to be uh, on the positive side, I think uh, recently we started getting a lot of positives. Uh, the first one is uh, a great support from flag states, especially Indian government. They came out with uh, a DD, DG circular in 2019, number three of 2019. The moment the piracy attack started increasing and uh, some Indians kidnapped, uh, they released this. They instructed every ship owner, Indian ship owner and the RPSL license holder not to employ any Indian seafarer on ships that are in coasting in Gulf of Guinea, those six, seven countries. So that is a big help for Indian seafarers and the ship owners because they have uh, a backing up from government orders. The same risk, however, remains <clears throat> when a ship calls for only one uh, voyage, like for example, she comes to Alvis Bay or South Africa, and uh, naturally the next load port for a tanker will be Gulf of uh, Guinea, port, some, some ports in Gulf of Guinea. Even if they call for one port call, the risk still remains same. So there are companies like uh, we started, uh, we stopped uh, vessels trading in Gulf of Guinea for the last three years, but that has got a huge uh, financial impact. Instead of going 300, 400 miles for a loading cargo, the ships have to come all the way in ballast up to Arabian Gulf for Indian ports. It's a huge impact on uh, commercial. Some more positives, I think uh, Gulf of Guinea declaration on suppression of uh, piracy is a great achievement uh, in this aspect. I think as on today, some 450 countries have uh, uh, party to it. Indian National Ship Owners Association and the Sanma Shipping also have signed this uh, declaration. I hope it has got a positive impact and uh, I believe the targets, what they have set 2023, not to have any kidnapping and 80% of the piracy attacks to be reduced by 2023 should happen actually in the earlier, even in 2022, it should happen. Again, uh, the Deep Blue project uh, officially flagged off by Nigerian president in front of IMO Secretary General. Being part of the IMO MSC meetings, uh, we understand that a good progress is made. We know that uh, judge, the judges are being trained on intelligence and uh, they are coordinating various law enforcement agencies. Capacity building is on, also going on. So that is uh, one positive. The biggest uh, relief for seafarer and ship owner is the new news that Danish Navy is present from early November 2021. It gives a great feeling earlier when we had the Somali pirates, how the Indian Navy used to be there. That gives a, a lot of confidence. And recently we heard a news that the Danish Navy protected ships by averting one potential attack. They killed four uh, pirates recently. So I think uh, what we will expect from uh, the shipping industry, seafarers and the owners is uh, maybe if Indian Navy can uh, send one of their naval vessels or like uh, earlier, multitask force or uh, on a rotation basis, some presence of uh, international Navy will be really helpful in uh, attacking. And if there are any positive learnings from uh, success in Somali piracy, that can also be adopted in Gulf of Guinea. Thank you. I'll go to the next slide. The next is, uh, I'll go to the Gulf of Aden and Red Sea. There are very few attacks and uh, very less uh, uh, incidents in this area. We see a lot of positive. Many naval vessels are available in this area. There is a reporting system, there is a proper IRTC corridor where uh, the ships are protected. So a lot of confidence is there for the ship owners in transiting this area. Of course, we carry the armed guards. But uh, somehow I see a lot of hesitancy in seafarers in trading this area, mainly because they don't want to go to Aden or Amen, Amen ports. So 12 nautical miles uh, in the Amen coast is called warlike area as per ITF. Even though the HRA is not reduced, uh, the warlick area still remains and uh, many seafarers are hesitant. And uh, by carrying armed guards, we started getting new challenges nowadays, especially for seafarers and ship owners. 
the seafarers after the introduction of covid we are keeping them as a, 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 a separate uh, you know group in a uh, in, in a isolation whenever we place armed guards even though some armed guard companies are testing them for covid negative it is a breach so every now and then when we place armed guards it's a difficult situation similar to seafarers armed guards also nowadays are unable to reach their homes uh, as per their contract their extended services because of the travel restrictions that uh, creates a lot of pressure on armed guards and uh, in september or october or july i think we saw one case uh, armed guard himself taking control of a ship and uh, diverting the vessel so this has could put uh, another major trouble for us uh, the people who come to protect us we have to be little scared of them anyway that uh, issue is sorted out and i think industry is back to normal now another thing happening in the recent last two months i would say is uh, commercial pressure on uh, vessels in ballast especially the the ships with uh, high uh, freeboard there is a pressure to transit this area a gulf of aden without arm guards at least some of our companies and our company is not uh, adhering to that and because of that there is a huge commercial impact uh, the cost involved in going diverting and picking up guards is on the owners account but uh, my question is the companies which are taking the seafarers and the property without arm guards what happens in case a missionary fails i'm not sure i know for sure there are uh, presence of uh, navy international navy in gulf of aden and they are monitoring very closely but i am not sure how quickly they will be able to support or whether they will be standby to assist a vessel which has uh, lost its uh, power or uh, main engine another challenge in this area is again complacency we know that somali pirates uh, have still capability to attack uh, so complying with uh, the best management practices is uh, important there are a lot of fishing vessels and uh, by look of it including armed guards and the ships masters they identify them as potential piracy attack this keeps happening uh, in the recent past and uh, another situation in red sea is in uh, saudi arabia yemen border a geopolitical situation which uh, i will cover again in the next uh, slide on persian gulf persian gulf uh, is an area very very critical because a lot of crude oil uh, supply chain is coming from there many countries including india is dependent on that area and in the last two and a half years this is a huge concern area in may june 2019 there were attacks on tankers and uh, there were mines and in 2021 we saw attacks using drones these are completely new kind of attacks to seafarers and even though a huge presence of navy a lot of reporting system monitoring is available we feel that this is uh, very limited in uh, controlling the kind of technological attack or uh, geopolitical situation and uh, definitely carriage of armed guards is not recommended and it is definitely not a solution another commercial impact in the last two and a half years is uh, a huge pre premium is charged on vessels trading in persian gulf the moment they cross uh, west of 50 degree 50 degree east uh, longitude there is a huge premium uh, involved this is affecting the tradeability some of the insurers have even uh, increased the limit they've gone beyond uh, 50 degree east and uh, the motive behind the attacks are not very clear to normal people uh, and it but we feel that uh, specific vessels are targeted based on some uh, some reasons so we are wondering why the premium is uh, not reducing or not stopping uh, finally all the cost is going to the end user so that is one area the insurance has to look at it whether they can charge the premium only for the ships which are high risk another common thing what uh, see the ships used to do is uh, in case there is no cargo we used to come and uh, anchor off uh, fujairah kofakan and usually for 10 days up to 10 days it is allowed free of cost so a huge number of vessels used to be waiting off uh, fujairah it is not possible now uh, because of uh, security risk and the additional cost they start drifting in the indian ocean uh, sometime closer to the pakistan or indian borders it is navigational hazard and in case of uh, southwest monsoon it is going to be a huge problem so considering a large uh, share of crude oil supply comes to india from this region i think we need to secure this uh, domain uh, and a, a different uh, 
technological approach will be required in my opinion so uh, the sorry next to, area is uh, sorry to interrupt sir uh, may i ask you to wind up in uh, the next 3 minutes in the interest of time sir so that we can i will do sir we can go to the next slide i will go very quickly and i will wind up as uh, should singapore and malacca streets a uh, lot of uh, small thefts but it's happening in the uh, east uh, eastern lane uh, it is not creating major problem with for seafarers however it is a shipping lane so it is a navigational concern i'll go to the next one the philippines we are quite happy in the last 3 years there are no uh, kidnapping for uh, the merchant vessels so the local navy has taken a lot of efforts can we go to the next slide please and uh, even in india we see a huge improvement earlier there used to be small pilferage and anchorages across uh, indian uh, coast but in the last one year uh, entire my friends uh, are so happy very very few incidents and uh, recently one incident one small theft happened indian uh, coast guard uh, reached there and uh, really solved the problem the next slide please uh, in the mediterranean there is no incidents of uh, piracy or anything only it is involving human migration and the trouble is when the ships go for uh, search and rescue activities they are not designed to accommodate migrants for a very long time so in imo msc meetings also we have uh, requested what we need immediate assistance is when the vessel goes uh, we need within a few hours or within a day some other vessel or some other arrangement made for transferring the migration the migrants otherwise what happens uh, we fear is that uh, the masters may start hesitating to provide assistance at sea which is a requirement as per the regulation the last slide so just to sum it up uh, i think the most important is securing the maritime shipping trade for uh, the strategic cargo for national interest i would like just to read one uh, sentence from the gulf of guinea declaration every person deserves to be safe while carrying out their work seafarers deserve no less actually this is one motto with which the gulf of guinea declaration hopefully uh, should achieve its targets of reaching no kidnapping in 2023 and lastly i would like to thank uh, the navy and uh, intelligence provided by various governments and initiatives because we talked about the data where how many people killed and kidnapped and injured but without these support i think uh, that numbers would have been you know tenfold 24th compliance with best management practices are taken care by the seafarers for their own safety but they are not uh, uh, they are innocent people they need to be protected from the uh, they are basically victims and they need to be protected from criminal activities so we need some kind of a immediate solution in piracy in uh, gulf of guinea and we need urgently some technological intervention for identifying and preventing the attacks using drones in uh, persian gulf and red sea i once again thank uh, ifc iwr and uh, crimaria for giving this opportunity to view uh, share our views thank you thank you very much sir for the insightful brief into the seafarers whom we all agree are what makes the world go round now with this we have uh, come to the end of the session uh, of the speaker session now is the time for uh, question and answers we have received considerable response from the participants and quite a number of insightful questions i will uh, try to amalgamate and direct to the concerned participant uh, the first question uh, that we have received uh, to mr gonzales uh, from unodc is with respect to the increasing trend of methamphetamine seizures in the western indian ocean region and northern arabian sea so what are the drivers and what are the programs uh, being undertaken by unodc to uh, stem this uh, threat if you could uh, throw some light on that thank you very much thank you very much um i don't know if that yes thank you um so you may know this is very well aware of this issue we have seen an increase in methamphetamine trafficking in the indian ocean uh, currently we are working on compiling data uh, for drug seizures at sea um, from 2021 
and completing some, um, some of the seizures in 2020. So we will have a better picture on, on how exactly how this has increased and um, in specifically which, which uh, also which months, uh, how is it trafficked um, in, in, we're going to try to uh, put the locations as well. Um, to allow Indian Ocean states to, to um, identify areas where uh, the, the, the drugs are being smuggled. But um, one of the things that we, uh, or the activities that we deliver in uh, several training centers, including Seychelles, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Bangladesh at the moment, is uh, VBSS training, Visit Board Search and Seizure. We will continue to train uh, maritime law enforcement agencies uh, either the Coast Guard or uh, together with other agencies to uh, counter maritime crime at sea, particularly drug trafficking. So uh, in our training exercises uh, in Maldives and Sri Lanka, we use real base scenarios. We use um, uh, vessels that have been confiscated um, and we, we uh, hide uh, drugs, of course, as part of the exercise. So we're trying to uh, improve our, our practical sessions to not only you know, have uh, big packages of heroin or uh, cannabis being hidden, but also going really in depth uh, in a vessel and, and try to see how uh, methamphetamines ha are being smuggled. So that's the current work that we have been doing so far. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that uh, wonderful answer and the wonderful work being done by UNODC. Now I have combined the next few questions and uh, since the questions were very broad based, uh, the single word, uh, the questions can be summed up is in uh, trust. So I would uh, invite uh, Captain Himadri Das, followed uh, by Mr. Jeffrey Payne and uh, Commander Duffy as to uh, lay out their perspective as to how uh, we can translate uh, such collaboration to enhance trust whereby we reach to the next level of uh, preventing maritime crime and safeguarding maritime safety and security. Uh, Captain uh, Das from NMF, please, sir. Uh, thank you, Ashok, uh, for that. Uh, uh, during the presentation, I did mention that uh, there's no one solution to developing trust and we need to develop on multiple tracks uh, to develop trust amongst partners for information sharing. So I think uh, uh, one of the things is uh, more and more frequent engagements amongst partners, uh, reliability of information. For example, if you have an information sharing agreement, uh, you must share in information in accordance with that agreement and not you know, hold back information because if, if, if information is held back, uh, then the trust starts uh, sort of crumbling thereafter. Uh, third, of course, is the number of engagements that you can have, such as live exercises, like the ones you had with the EU, et cetera, the number of you know, workshops that we are having where we're exchanging notes with each other. And uh, so we realize that without trust, uh, it can't happen. And so we need to work on trust building as much as on capacity building. And I don't think there's only any one, you know, one magic wand or a panacea which is going to, you know, uh, solve this this problem. It needs work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, by each one who's involved in information sharing and you know generating a you know comprehensive picture. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I now uh, invite uh, Mr. Jeffrey Payne from NISA. Um, as for uh, transitioning over to uh, actual. Um, you know, real, real, real world impact from, from a lot of what we're talking about. Um, again, there is no single answer just as, as the captain just highlighted, but one thing that does matter that is part of NDA conversations that often falls off our agenda because we're the seafarers, we're the policy analysts, we're the people in the trenches, so to speak, um, working these issues that it, it does fall off the priority list of senior leaders. Um, because the maritime domain is, is often harder to process in traditional policy uh, making areas. Um, so there needs to be an active internal kind of advocacy for making sure that maritime issues rise up the policymaking kind of list because 
bottom line is it doesn't matter if you're from the United States or India or from Seychelles, um, that your wealth, your stability of your country relies upon uh, the seas. And so um, this is something that needs to be prioritized, especially in the Indian Ocean region, um, given the, the trajectory uh, of, of economic possibility and the rising kind of demographics of the region. Because um, otherwise, you, you, you know, you're going to be playing catch up uh, to other political considerations. So, I mean, that would be one way to answer it. Over. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, Commander Kevin Duffy, may I request you to add your two cents to this conversation? Sure. I, I, I do think there are some, um, some real specific measures and tools that can be taken um, to both enhance trust and understanding and, and, um, and using that trust and understanding to be more operationally effective. So um, things like uh, agreements that allow um, hot pursuit into uh, territorial waters, uh, you know, when somebody's um, chasing a suspect or uh, joint patrols or ship rider agreements across those areas. Um, you know, that's, that's obviously premised on trust, but it, there's immediate um, operational impact. And I, and I think on the kind of the back end of that same, that same thing, um, MOUs, memorandums of understanding for the disposition of detainees. So if, if uh, operational assets uh, wind up with detainees from a case, uh, what are they gonna do with those detainees? Where are they gonna send them? It's, it should probably be a, a regional, um, partner that takes the that takes the case uh, and I, we've seen in um, in Gulf of Guinea this is a this is a major issue a lot of the non-regional navies uh, that deploy there um, will will state outright that they won't interdict uh, they're there for a piracy patrol but won't interdict pirates because they don't know what they're going to do uh, with those pirates so development of those agreements and, and understanding um, the, you know that the legal finish and, and UNODC does a lot of work on this. I know and uh, globally, um, understanding that the legal mechanisms are there, so that if I'm from country A, we do an interdiction. I know that uh, I can pass off those the people I interdicted and the evidence and everything, um, you know, via an MOU to a country that's going to have a legitimate legal finish. Um, so I think those are real specific tools we can use to to enhance trust. And that's uh, all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. A uh, few key points brought out. I'm sure we have seen uh, some successful apprehensions based on the hot pursuits which you mentioned, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. Now, uh, coming to the next question, uh, it's uh, directed towards uh, Captain Subaya from uh, INSA. Uh, sir, uh, the audience is uh, generally appreciative of the quantum of uh, statistics, which are very comprehensive in nature. So uh, the question uh, that there is, is uh, what is the general source uh, for a seafarer or for a company, a medium sized company? What are the various information or intelligence sources when it comes to such uh, threats and threat analysis? And uh, more specifically as to how can uh, centers such as IFC, Iowa, which put out a lot of uh, products for uh, seafarers uh, improve their production so as to better address your needs? Thank you very much. Thank you for the appreciation. Uh, the data is available in many sources, some official and uh, some uh, through the private sources. The main source of what we get is uh, two. One is the IMB. They have a live piracy map and they also have the piracy map of 2020, means the previous two years running. So we can go and get uh, each attack so it is a very good tool when the ships are trading in one area to another area. We cannot be sure of all the areas. The second is, of course, uh, uh, your database. Uh, in, in, INSA is receiving monthly reports from uh, you and uh, the, the data provided in your website also very, very nice. So these two are uh, quite official in nature. We can collect most of the data from here. We keep uh, employing the armed guards from different companies. So after some time, we start getting uh, initial information from them. For example, IMB and uh, your database, I need to go and you know uh, review when the ships are going. Even though they are live, I need to approach. But whereas our private sources, as the attack initiates, within a few minutes, we start getting information to the company security officer. Even in a medium level company, if we establish good contacts, 
And then as it progresses, we will know sometimes it ends up saying that it is a wrong one. It may never come into the IMB or your database, but it is captured by the private uh, organizations and private uh, people. To come to the second uh, question, how the product can be more use, uh, user friendly, I feel at least uh, people who are part of uh, INSA, uh, we come to know about your product, we are getting the information, passing it on to everybody. I am not sure uh, the companies which are based outside India, are they aware of uh, the product? I'm not sure. I'm just uh, saying that that is one way to look at it, uh, maybe broader uh, range can be, you know, uh, by by meeting the other uh, shipping companies that can be and specifically uh, the data which is coming from you has got uh, smuggling and various other things so the bulletin becomes quite large though the person who is interested will have the data on piracy what uh, we are most interested it is available in one gist but probably the length of the uh, the material knowing the seafarers or anybody today uh, even we don't read newspapers we only go for uh, you know in shots so probably we can think of uh, having a shorter version also like how you do for the half early one small just something to that this is a offhand uh, suggestion but uh, definitely i can uh, share with my friends and uh, come back with uh, more thorough feedback uh, from the industry from insa privately offline thank you thank you very much sir for the valuable suggestions uh, some of the Actions are already underway and some we have made note of and we'll try to uh, do better so as to serve the seafarers. Uh, with, this, you, uh, uh, with this, unfortunately, uh, we have come to the end of uh, allotted time for the question and answer session. Uh, I would thank all the speakers uh, for the insightful uh, comments and the frank responses. May I now invite Captain Swamijit Mohanty, Indian Navy, Director of the Information Fusion Center, Indian Ocean Region, for his concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Ashok. Good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, let me thank the esteemed speakers, the audience, and last but not the least, the organization team of IFCIOR and Primario for this fantastic workshop. I personally feel enriched by today's session and I'm sure that the audience feels the same. We are indeed honored to have had opening remarks from His Excellency, Mr. Seppo Nurmi, the Deputy Head of the European Union Delegation to India and Bhutan and Vice Admiral Ravneet Singh, the Deputy Chief of Naval Staff. It amply demonstrates the importance accorded to the subject of maritime domain awareness and interoperability by India and EU, and I'm grateful to them for having spared their valuable time to address this very pertinent workshop. We were also privileged to have Admiral Professor Kolombage, the Foreign Secretary of Sri Lanka, deliver the keynote address today on IORA's perspective on maritime security. With greater use of seas for global trade and connectivity, the threats emanating from sea are also increasing manifold. Response to these challenges requires enhanced situational awareness of the maritime activities in the region. Further, the scale and scope and the multinational nature of maritime activities make it untenable for individual countries or agencies to address the twin requirements of situational awareness and law enforcement. Hence, collaborative efforts between maritime agencies is not only desirable, but essential. Towards addressing the maritime security challenges, achieving comprehensive domain awareness of maritime area of interest is of paramount importance. Although there are various definitions of MDA, in broad terms, they all involve gaining an understanding of the position and intention of actors in a given maritime environment. The wide array of objectives for which MDA is considered essential, as well as the geographical and temporal scan, 
over which such awareness is sought generate significant challenges. With increasing geopolitical and geoeconomic salience of the maritime commons, the need for security and by extension, domain awareness is growing in importance and complexity. We believe that the collaborative multilateral efforts would enable collation and exchange of diverse regional data, sharing of resources, and the pooling in of expertise and experience available amongst individual players, thus enabling better awareness of the vast maritime space. Therefore, the Information Fusion Center Indian Ocean region was set up in December 2018 with the vision of collaborative maritime safety and security. We undertake this collaboration under five pillars. Our most important collaborative effort is the team we have here at the center, which consists of international liaison officers from partner countries. ILOs are our biggest assets who contribute significantly to our venture by their domain expertise. While we interface systems for data fusion, we also fuse regional expertise and experience through this approach. Our second collaborative effort is in the linkages we maintain with multiple agencies, and we are privileged to count EU Cremario as one of our linkages. We are linked up with more than 50 international agencies, including IMO, UNODC, and Interpol, as well as NMF and INSA at a national level. Very recently, we also linked up with the Djibouti Code of Conduct, Jeddah Amendment, and of future collaboration for maritime safety and security. Our third effort at collaboration is in sharing our reports and analysis with our partners, which the previous speaker alluded to. The center carries out analysis of various maritime security incidents, which are published regularly and shared with our partners. Our fourth effort at collaboration is through interactions. Towards this end, the center hosts various delegations from partner nations and organizes workshops for enhancing the shared understanding of contemporary maritime challenges and the role of fusion centers in improving shared awareness of the maritime security situation. This workshop today is of course part of this fourth pillar and I'm sure all present here have gained from the rich expertise of the speakers. Our last, but definitely not the least effort at collaboration is through sharing of operational inputs with nations and agencies. This would, however, not be possible without comprehensive maritime domain awareness amongst all stakeholders. To sum up, I would like to reiterate that the five pillars of collaboration of IFC-IOR are aimed at improving the overall maritime safety and security of the region, and this would require complete maritime domain awareness. In addition to MDA, common definitions of various maritime activities is essential to have a common understanding of the maritime domain. I'm confident that this workshop has been a fruitful one and would be a harbinger of many such initiatives as part of a strong commitment towards fostering safer and more secure Indian Ocean region and beyond. I would like to highlight here that hearing firsthand the plight of seafarers due to piracy and armed robbery, which was brought out by Captain Subaya from INSA, I think it increases our resolve to collaborate with all like-minded partners to completely eradicate these maritime security threats at the earliest. In the end, I would once again like to thank the speakers for having shared their rich domain knowledge and thank the audience for participating in this very important workshop on maritime domain awareness and interoperability. Thank you very much for sparing your time and your kind attention. Thank you very much, sir. May I now invite the project director of European Union's uh, Crimario project, the co-organizer for today's workshop, Mr. Martin Kochi Ingler, for his concluding remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Lieutenant Commander. Are you able to hear me? Loud and clear, sir. Uh, good morning, afternoon, uh, Mr. Seppo, Vice Admiral Ravnit Singh, Admiral's distinguished participants. Throughout this very enriching seminar, 
we have heard much about the threats which face the region, be them man-made or natural, and discussed many preventive measures. At the political level, Admiral Colombage has reminded us that there are many Indo-Pacific strategies from a good number of actors from inside and outside the Indian Ocean region. But there is no common Indian Ocean strategy. And the Admiral proposed that IORA be empowered to address such a strategy. At the strategic level, we have been reminded that there are numerous valuable constructs, such as IONS, which offer forums for discussion and decision when potential options are at hand. Moreover, we have been reminded that information fusion centers are flourishing, and we touched upon how to maximize their outputs, as well summarized by Captain Dust. But Professor Payne also reminded us of the data revolution in the maritime domain. And we are suffering from an avalanche of data and the dilemma faced by states is whether to opt for open or closed systems. Murad Gor Gorbel provides us with an in-depth insight as to how the IMO manages its approach to data compilation and sharing. And Joshua Gonzalez from UNODC reminded us that this magnitude of data needs to be processed through human interaction, making best use of the analysis tools available. Key in all this is that it should lead to a legal finish. So moving to the operational world, we have heard that there are many challenges in the field of MDA and interoperability most related to sovereignty and asset sharing. And here is where Commander Duffy reminded us of the numerous coordinating and command mechanisms which exist. And when addressing the optimum solutions, one needs to consider defining the sea space, the actors and their willingness, the nature of the adversary, and defining the mission and the purpose. Captain Stubaya, then from the Indian National Ship Owners Association, provided us with a true description of the threats faced by the merchant fishing globally, delving into the importance of MDA to guide merchant shipping through dangerous areas and the value of naval presence. So when it comes to addressing the threats, why is that best our op objective must be to prevent such incidents? At worst, our operational planners need to be prepared to respond in a timely manner. And to do this, operators need to have access to actionable information, which should be as close as possible to real time, because every bit and byte counts. And it is here where we appreciate the value of common information exchange platforms, which we can all resort to in times of crisis to exchange that value piece of, valuable piece of information securely, including non-classified information, because knowing which, ships, which safe shipping is around allows us to maximize the use of those assets in case of emergencies, but it also allows us to sift the threats from the safe contacts. And this is where I feel that Cremario brings its value to the equation as it strives to offer neutral, secure, and unbiased information tools to all regional partners through its IORIS and its share its platforms. Also offering the same partners the opportunity to meet and discuss such salient issues as we are doing today. So before signing off, I wanted to reiterate three essential factors uh, as captured by Captain Das, if we really want to make a difference in MDA and interoperability. First of all, strengthening regional cooperation needs a multi-dimensional approach. No one size fits all. Secondly, discussions we must consider have to include the human factor, more specifically trust, and how this can be built. 
And finally, we need to walk the talk, moving from words to actions. Otherwise, the outputs of today will not reap the benefits that they deserve. So to conclude, I want to thank all the esteemed briefers for their in-depth presentations, which I am sure you feel have enriched us all. I'd like to thank you, the participants, for joining us and for your active contribution to the conference. To the captain and staff of the IFCI AOR for accepting to join forces with us and organize this very worthy event. And finally, to the Cromario team, more specifically, as Isabel Gashivinson, for her and the team's consolidated efforts and making this possible. Thanks to you all and looking forward to the next one. Thank you very much, so. I would like to thank all speakers for the time and effort. The feedback form for all participants will be emailed shortly. We look forward to receiving your valuable inputs. Before we leave today, let me thank all of you for sparing your valuable time. I would once again place on record our sincere and heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers. We have learned so much. We at IFC Iowa and Crimario would endeavor to continue organizing such interactions with domain experts to further collaborative efforts for safety and security at sea. Warm wishes for the remainder of 2021 and a happy 2022. Thank you.